Well, that was quick. Uh, thanks very much. It usually takes about five minutes and about three shouts, but that's excellent. Okay, I'm going to be extremely brief because we want to hear from Europe. Uh, and to, ge uh, to demonstrate our genuine transatlanticism, I would say that, that w and, and that we are not EU bashers, despite what you may have heard this morning. In fact, quite the opposite. We want the European Union to be as successful as possible. Uh, we have with us today, I think, one of the finest representatives of the wider Europe, and I mean that in a most comprehensive way. Beginning his career in the Czechoslovak Foreign Service, and I underline Czechoslovak, a country that used to exist, in 1988, uh, Miroslav Lajčák progressed rapidly uh, up the Slovak diplomatic ladder uh, after Slovakia gained independence uh, at the beginning of 1993 and ended up during the last decade uh, as one of the key figures, I think, uh, in the European Union, not only dealing uh, with the West Balkans, uh, but also deciding on the West Balkans. And let me very briefly uh, read from his bio. Uh, Miroslav is Managing Director for Europe and Central Asia. He's actually expanded his portfolio beyond, of course, the Balkans, uh, at the European External Action Service. He has previously served as Director General for Political Affairs in the Slovak Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, has, a, as I've mentioned, extensive experience in Southeast Europe, where he was best known for his role as mediator and personal representative of the EU High Representative uh, Xavier Solana in Montenegro in 2006, where he oversaw uh, what we thought would be a controversial uh, referendum, but it turned out uh, to be a representative referendum. Um, in fact, maybe you need to add Montenegro as one of, Montenegro as one of your languages in, the, uh, in your bio. I notice you have hyphenated Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian. Uh, so, actually, without further ado, because I want to give as much time to Miro as possible, uh, let me leave it there, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Janusz, for your invitation and for presenting me to the audience. I would also like to thank Heather Connolly for her uh, invitation to this conference. And I have to say I love speaking about the Western Balkans here in the United States because I find the discussion here uh, more difficult, but also more inspiring. And I'm well aware of the fact that I'm the only participant in today's conference who doesn't come from either the United States or the Western Balkans. I'm representing the European Union, so don't be surprised that my views might, might not be c totally compatible with the views presented here, but uh, take them as an authentic European Union views on the region. And I really believe that the, in order to stimulate the discussion, it's in everybody's interest that we do not st uh, repeat the same points, but we rather uh, engage in an exchange of sometimes different views. But our views are, as a matter of fact, not different. The truth al also is that every time when I'm sp invited to speak about the Western Balkans, I f my first question is if there is even a possibility to say something new, something that hasn't been s said many times before. Because we seem to know everything about the region, and so many of us and so many of you in this room have spent years in, in the region and uh, know so much about the realities of, of the region. Uh, but on the other hand, if this was true and if, if everything has been said and everything has been done, then uh, the Balkans today would be a much better place and we wouldn't be organizing, organizing conferences like this one, the same as we no longer organize conferences about the Central Europe, for example. So that means that something must be wrong. And uh, I would say that amount of our investment, our political, military, financial investment into the region is just not adequate to the results we, we see, we receive, namely to the progress achieved on the ground. So what's wrong and what needs to change? I was asked to, and I will speak more about European Union policy in the region, not about the region itself so much because we have two panels discussing the most uh, complex issues in the region in much greater detail. So uh, let me start by saying that uh, it has been widely accepted that the European Union's enlargement in 2004 has been a success. Why was this uh, so? Because the European Union, on the side of the candidate countries, and I come from one of the countries that used to be candidate for at that time, European Union integration was number one priority. That means everything that was done 
in the political lives of this country was measured against the ultimate goal of joining the European Union and was uh, considered whether it will help or will, will not help to get the countries closer and faster there. Second, there was wide political consensus and very strong uh, public support for the European Union integration. And third, it was understood that it's about reforms. It's about changing states, societies, systems, and the membership comes as a logical consequence of this change. On the European Union side, there was uh, conditionality. There was clear and transparent set of rules for the process. Th uh, the European Union applied individual and merits-based approach to each of the candidate countries. And there was a mutual respect to the rules of the game as, as set and defined by the European Union. And let's not forget that regional cooperation has proved to be an extremely efficient instrument that countries of Central and Eastern Europe profited from both regionally and also in their integration process. So are we in the same situation with the countries of the Western Balkans? No. Why not? There are many reasons and let me elaborate on them. It's been clearly stated and constantly reiterated that the Western Balkans have European perspective. This is a clear offer of membership in a broad European family, which is voluntarily based on democratic values, on single market and unified rules. And this is not a small thing. Just see how much the countries I'm also dealing with uh, uh, in my current capacity, countries like Georgia, Ukraine or Moldova would wish to have the same perspective, but they don't. So I guess I'm not wrong to claim that the European Union idea is more broadly accepted and wanted by the common people in the Western Balkans rather than by their political elites. With all due respect to Zlatko, of course. Uh, while people rather focus more on the carrots of the membership, the leaders uh, seem to be more worried about the sticks that uh, are attached to it. And there is actually a huge discrepancy between expectations of people who want progress, European Union membership, who want uh, freedom of movement, better life, and prosperity, and the effort, or lack of it, on the side of uh, many politicians in the region who revert to their individual interests, elitism, oligarchy, sometimes retrograde political concepts, and quest for full and uh, not necessarily transparent control over political and economic processes in their countries or in parts of the countries. And as a logical consequence, the European Union idea is n still not the leading and predominant one to make a U-turn in the mentality in the region. European Union integration is important, but it's objectively not a number one priority in the region. It is being mentioned, but it's uh, still not the driving force. It's uh, rather more about words, not yet about the deeds and results. Too many bilateral and post-conflict issues in the Western Balkans still prevail. As we all know, the name issue, the border issue, the definition of the, f the state issue, minority and refugees issues. And there is also this constant quasi-dilemma, which we hear time and again from a number of politicians from the region. If I have to choose between the European Union integration and, and you can insert whatever you want, my, my entity, my language, I, I will definitely go for the... the for the, for the latter, not for the former, and which is certainly not helpful. So as a result, the Western Balkans seem still too consumed by domestic politics and by electoral calendars. But European Union is determined to do as much as we can to help the region. But at the same time, it's clear that we cannot do more and we cannot want the European integration uh, of the Western Balkans more than the countries themselves want. Joining of the European Union requires a lot of work, which is not politically attractive in the short term. But it is about what's best for the countries, and it's about what their people want. And you know how popular the idea of the European integration is in each of the countries of the Western <coughs> Balkans. At the same time, European Union, and we must not forget it, needs to be sure that each applicant is fully able, willing, and prepared to respect and fulfill our rules which means the decades of the European Union evolution cannot and ma must not be undermined just because one or more countries wish to join. Moreover, enlargement shall not only solve the problems of the regions of, of the Western Balkan, but it shall also further strengthen the European Union. And that's also important to keep in mind. So I'd like to stress here two important principles. First, the European Union integration process must be about reforms. 
It must be about wanting political, economic, and social transition. A membership comes at the end, as I said, as a logical consequence of the effort and implemented reforms that have made these countries compatible with the Euro European Union standards. So it's not about managing the change in the region, it's about helping the countries to, to manage the change, but the, the bulk of the work must be done on the ground, and we are here and we stand ready to help and assist because it's in everybody's interest. So the European Union membership is not a reward for the best efficient lobbying effort in Brussels or in the capitals of the EU member states. It's also in, important not to forget. It's a license given after lots of successful exams and hard work. Now, a lot has been said already, and I'm sure will be said uh, uh, also in the second panel, about the current role of the European Union in the Western Balkans region. So let me just bring a couple of facts about what the European Union is doing in the region today. We have the so-called stabilization and association process, which is the framework for the EU negotiations with the Western Balkan countries. And you know that for the countries of Central Europe, the uh, European Union proposed association process, while in the Western Balkans we have stabilization and association uh, process. And this is the process that should lead them all the way to their uh, accession to the European Union. And it has three aims. First, stabilizing the countries and encouraging the, their swift transition to a market economy. Second, promoting regional cooperation. And third, membership of the European Union. We offer so-called stabilization and association agreements to the potential applicants and candidate countries. They are very comprehensive contractual frameworks which are covering political dialogue, regional cooperation, the so-called four freedoms, that means freedom of movement of goods, services, capital and people. Uh, they cover justice and home affairs, approximation of laws and law enforcement, financial cooperation and help implementation rules and assistance, and other sectoral cooperation policies such as telecommunication, energy, environment, and so on and so forth. So it's about all encompassing frame of reforms and it comes together, and let's, let's not underestimate it, with free of charge advice and know-how. So if the candidate country or applicant country is serious about its European future, then it makes the, this future very tangible it, because it simply is there. And the European Union stands ready to assist and to help. Then the next and probably the most attractive part of our assistance is the so-called IPA, Instrument for Pre-Accession Assistance. The total funding for the region of the Western Balkans for the period 2007 through 2013 is 11.5 billion euros, which is not a small thing again. And these funds are intended for transition, for institution building, for regional development, for cross-border cooperation, etc. And on top of it, in the Western Balkans, we also employ our common security and defense policy tools in order to help to stabilize the region and enable its progress towards the European Union membership. Here I'm talking about our civilian mis missions such as ULEX in Kosovo or military missions such as U4 in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And this combination of enlargement, financial and CSDP elements is expressed also operationally in our double-headed represent representations that exist both in Kosovo and in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, we phased out one in uh, Fyro Macedonia at the beginning of this year. So here, let me point out that this three-component approach, it's a novelty and has been tailor-made for the region of the Western Balkans. Now to take a bit of stock. What has been achieved so far? Where we are at the end of 2011? We have three current candidates for the EU membership, Croatia, Fyro Macedonia and Montenegro, and four potential candidates, Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo and Serbia, out of, out of which two, uh, Albania and Serbia already applied for membership, but they are still waiting for the European Union to grant them the candidate status. And what the year 2011 means for each of them? You know that uh, European Commission just uh, last month produced a very detailed progress report about the progress achieved by each of the countries. I'm certainly not going to repeat it, but one sentence per country should be probably sufficient here. Croatia is about to join. This country is a full proof to the rest of the Western Balkans that it is possible and it is achievable. Croatia will sign uh, its accession treaty on the 9th of December, and from then on, the, our Croatian partners will be sitting with us in the Council, in the working groups, first as observers and later on as a full-fledged participants. <coughs> Montenegro fulfilled the recommendations from the last year's progress report and uh, 
Therefore, the Commission proposed the opening of accession negotiations. We are waiting for the decision of the December European Council on the date. Major steps have been done by Serbia on the ICTY file, which was closed this year, and th this is bringing this country very close to the candidate status. What needs to be done now, of course, is the implementation of the commitments already accepted by Serbia in the dialogue with Pristina. And as we speak, the, the dialogue is taking place in, uh, in, in Brussels. Fire on Macedonia, we hope that the momentum to resolve the name issue could be restored after the elections and formation of the government in Skopje and with the new Greek government. And it's an opportunity we should not miss. In Albania, we have seen an awful political deadlock uh, uh, throughout most of the year 2011, but uh, I, we are also pleased to see some very promising parliamentarian activities in Albania, and I really want to hope that this is going to, to, to restart the process. Yes, keep us, our fingers crossed uh, for this. Most of our current effort with all our tools goes nowadays to Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo, and it's no surprise that it's exactly these two cases, these two countries that are being debated here today in much greater detail than the rest of the region. In Bosnia, Herzegovina, we have been constantly repeating the warning of losing yet another year and that the risk of falling behind the rest of the region is imminent. And unfortunately, the Commission's progress report confirms this as 2011 has not produced much progress. No agreement on a central level government has been found. No real European platform has emerged among the political parties and no real engagement on the reforms among political parties was noticed by the Europe European Union. Without going into details, because this will be discussed uh, later on, let me simply state that Bosnia-Herzegovina's problem, problem is twofold. First, its political establishment is divided over how the country should function and second, its, its constitutional setup, which, which, which was inherited as a settlement of the war, reinforces these divisions. European Union is willing to help, but will not impose solutions to such fundamental questions. We believe that there is no alternative to local solution and local comprom compromise, which we wholeheartedly support. We stand ready to help to transform the consensus on the EU integration that is a very strong feature in Bosnia-Herzegovina, into a process, a process through which we will be able to answer the other existential questions. That means to address the problems against the backdrop of the European Union pers membership perspective. And our readiness was also translated into a tailor-made approach for Bosnia-Herzegovina in particular, which was reflected first in our March strategy, which was adopted by the 27 foreign ministers of the European Union, then in, uh, in May, uh, in the launch of the Structured Dialogue on Judiciary in <laughs> September by appointment of our, reinf uh, our reinforced double-headed representative who is the EU Special Representative and the head of EU delegation in Sarajevo. And in October, with the new Foreign Affairs Council conclusions that uh, defined our current uh, modified approach on the EU for Althea operation and also indicate the proposed or suggested way forward for the OHR. The next step, as we see it, will be to give our presence enough time to demonstrate its potential on the ground before we move further. What has been done by the European Union so far, particularly in 2011, I believe confirms that we do have strategy and instruments for Bosnia-Herzegovina. The other concern is Kosovo and by implication Serbia. It is another case where we are convinced that the European perspective that they both share is the most conducive context for finding the way forward that practical solutions which are based on the European Union rules, uh, famous acquis, agree, which are must and must be agreeable to both, should be defined and implemented. That a proactive facilitation by the European Union helps to turn attention to the common objective of Brussels. European Union-led effort is based on all the values and principles we strongly believe in. It is a dialogue which is discussing issues to improve lives of people and some of their basic freedoms, such as freedom of mo movement, uh, right for security, and so on. It is a transparent exchange of positions between the two partners that voluntarily sit at the same table and discuss directly. I've heard some criticism towards this dialogue, and uh, you know that Robert was invited to take part in this conference, but he is chairing the dialogue right now or facilitating the dialogue. I don't think that much of public diplomacy 
uh, would be uh, hel conducive and uh, helpful to achieving the goals of the dialogue. I can hardly uh, remember any statement coming of Belgrade that made uh, the situation in, in Pristina and in Kosovo easier to, to accept the dialogue and vice versa. So, uh, but let, let, let's be assured that all the EU member states and the United States are fully in the picture. United States participates in the dialogue and, uh, and plays a very important role in the dialogue. So we believe that this is the best way forward. It's a best way forward for both, for Serbia and for Kosovo, because it is a step of towards normalization, towards stabilization and towards the European Union. It's the only platform where Belgrade and Pristina are talking to each other. So it, it should be in everybody's interest to strengthen this channel. And it's, we, we need to come to the point when both Belgrade and Pristina will appreciate and value and, and, uh, the, to having this channel and will work to, to broaden the scale of issues that are being discussed as a part of the dialogue. And this dialogue is also very important more broadly. First, to prevent a potential frozen conflict in the region and particularly in the no northern Kosovo, which, we will not, which is not acceptable. To keep the enlargement strategy alive and tangible to both of them, to help European integration of Kosovo together with the rest of the region, and to reiterate European Union support to the principle of territorial integrity. This is the principle that we apply throughout the region. We don't believe in partitions being uh, a way forward or solution of, to any of the problems the Western Balkans is facing. On the contrary. So all that I just said about the European Union engagement leads me to a logical conclusion that the transformational power of the European Union en enlargement has proved successful and that we shall pursue uh, these policies further. Such a comprehensive enlarge engagement is our strategy. It's our offer to the Western Balkans and it's our testimony to what we believe in. And you can rest assured that the European Union will remain engaged. This is our firm conviction which is reiterated again and again. Now, coming back to the title of this conference, Time for Change, maybe I could suggest uh, a change of paradigm. First, we must build our policies on realities, not on wishful thinking. As much as we might wish that Europe was not divided on the issue of Kosovo, that's a reality. So instead of crying, why is it 22-5, we shall build our policies on, on, on the fact that it is how it is. As much as we might wish OHR to be given much greater support, particularly from the European Union, it's not the case because majority of the EU member states don't believe that this is the right way to, to pro progress in, the European, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and they would wish to give much more space to the European agenda rather than to the OHR agenda, which is a reality whether we like it or not. So let's stop saying what if and let's start building our policies on where we are. This is probably the best point of departure. We should, we should not get stuck in time it's impossible to deal with the challenges of 2011 through the instruments of 90s. We shall be very clear that status quo is not a strategy. Maintaining the status quo is not offering uh, positive and sustainable solutions for the Western Balkans. On the contrary, it's a way of deepening crisis. And also, our approach it is not and should not be about individuals, about personalities. It should be about countries, about processes, about inclusiveness, and about the perspective for each of the countries and for the whole region. And, and it was also mentioned here, we have to see things in wider perspective. And speaking about Western Balkans, we must not forget about the Arab Spring, about uh, Iran, about other issues, because whenever we uh, require political decision, this is how people look at the issues, to put it on the scale of challenges uh, that they are facing globally. These are important points if we want to implement a strategy which is credible and which is tangible for the region, and this is what we want. So to conclude, I'm convinced that the European Union's enlargement policy remains the right vehicle for the Western Balkans. Compared to the previous enlargement, our approach has become more tailor-made and we, will com uh, we continue working on, the, on it, as I explained before. But such approach will still need to be formulated against the backdrop of European perspective and on the basis of the European Union's best practices and acquis. And the candidates and applicants will still be judged on the, on the, on the basis of their individual merits and achievements. 
the fact that European Union is going through its internal challenges and has to de dedicate much more time and energy to its internal issue does not mean that we have departed from our, from our commitment towards the, uh, the region of the Western Balkans. Enlargement is and will continue to be our policy with regard to the Western Balkans and we are proving our commitment through the progr progress achieved every year as re reflected in the Commission's uh, progress report and in the Council decisions. So no one can say that the process has, c has come to a standstill, because it's not true. And I'm sure that the interest of the United State, States is the same, because we have jointly invested so much in the region, and we need to preserve our investment together. <coughs> the, and therefore, the full and clear backing of the, of the European Union in the Western Balkans by the United States is necessary. The European Union needs clearly demonstrated and applied trust of the United States. We are allies, and we are allies in the Western Balkans project. European Union's success in the region is our common interest, and it's our common success. U United States has played and continues to play a very important role in uh, the Western Balkans region. We are fully aware of it, and we fully appreciate it. We have a good track record of successes in the region, particularly when the United States and the European Union acted united, formulated common visions, and spoke with one voice. And we have always been a good tandem of hard and soft power, and we shall continue to play this leading role together and united. And this philosophy has been outlined and reflected a number of times also by the statements uh, mm, uh, delivered by the U.S. officials, such as uh, Phil Gordon's speech in uh, Sarajevo in June or his presentation to the Congress last week, and I'm very pleased that, uh, to say that we share the philosophy of our approach. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is our strategy, our offer, and our vision. We are convinced this is the only credible way forward. We are not disengaging. On the contrary, when talking about the Western Balkans, as critical as we might be about the actions and activities and the role played by the European Union, we shall still acknowledge, and let's face it, that the European Union is the only international player with a very concrete, tangible and positive strategy for the region, promising those countries a very clear perspective. Perspective that we offer, namely the membership perspective, should therefore be our joint program and our joint platform for our future common actions. And that's, that, that's, I believe, is the best we can jointly do for the region of the Western Balkans. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Miroslav. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, and I want to jump in with the first question, probably an obvious one. Uh, you referred to it near the end about commitments. But given the crisis within the, the European Union itself, I don't want to exaggerate it too much, but uh, there are those that do. Nevertheless, there is a crisis in the Eurozone, economic stagnation, uh, sovereign debts, increasing social disquiet. How does this impact on enlargement policy amongst voters, amongst politicians, particularly if they begin to equate, uh, let's say, the performance of countries such as Greece and Italy and others with the West Balkan aspirants? In other words, uh, the idea that they're not well governed, that they don't know how to do budgeting, uh, that they're corrupt, or there are some very special interests involved, that they do not meet basic European Union criteria. Is that having an impact, would you say, in, in EU policy? Yes and no. As I like to say, European Union is an organism rather than a mechanism. We are going through different times and different periods. Uh, there are moments when enlargement is very high on the list of our priorities, and there are moments when we focus on uh, different issues. But what's most important, it is our official policies that has never been questioned. The fact that the European Union has uh, got less time and less money to deal with the Western Balkans means that we expect more from the countries of the region to do their homework and to come to us with more of solutions rather than problems. And uh, once again, it has never been questioned. Uh, our commitment is here to stay, and uh, it ev everything depends on the progress on the ground in the countries of, of the Western Balkans region. Okay, thanks very much. Questions I see Mike, uh, lady next to Mike. Let's start with the two of you, actually, Mike. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mike Holtzel, Johns Hopkins Sice. Thank you, Mr. Lychak, uh, for your comprehensive and hard-hitting remarks. Uh, you said that we can't um, hold
hold with the status quo in the Western Balkans. I'm assuming that uh, you're not talking about changing of borders in that regard. I mean, that's one status quo that I would have thought we would hold to. Okay. Uh, Okay, um, my question is the following. Um, you mentioned the, the various tools the EU has, including stability mechanisms, including EU4 uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in the previous panel, several people said that any change in borders would be romantic and counterproductive and uh, have a domino effect. They didn't say that they would also be immoral because any change of borders, especially with regard to the Republic of Srpska, would have been the result of ethnic cleansing and genocide of the population. So my question is very simple. Um, has the EU considered um, moving some of its EU4 troops up to Birchko, which is a federal district, uh, as a demonstration that even though the EU has a structured dialogue with the RS, that uh, it wants to make absolutely clear that the RS is part of the uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that's a fact of life, and uh, the presence of however many hundred EU soldiers in Birchko would demonstrate that. Is that something you might consider? Thank you, Ivana Howard, National Endowment for Democracy. You read that the title of the presentation or the conference today is Time for Change, but it's a new transatlantic approach. And you mentioned the U.S. towards the very end, maybe one more time before, but surprisingly you mostly talked about the EU approaches and only mentioned U.S. in a sense that the U.S. should join you in these approaches. And uh, of course, um, I think there, it's no secret here in Washington that there's an impression that there is really a no joint approach, particularly when it comes to Bosnia. And what happened with Lady Ashton's visit to Banja Luka earlier this year and the resulting um, structural changes um, was something that really drew a line between the approaches between um, the European Union towards resolving the issue in Bosnia and the US. And that the relationship between the two is not maybe as, uh, as nice as everybody would like to, to say publicly. Um, I think most of the time when we ask, when we ask uh, people such as yourself, everybody says, no, everything is fine. But I think, in my opinion, recently, the way that this was illustrated most prominently is when a friend of mine recently told me that um, an EU technocrat asked him at one point, why do you trust the Americans more than us? Has, have we really gotten to a point that there is no trust between the Americans and the Europeans, as I think there is an impression looking at it from here, particularly when it comes to Bosnia? Thank you. I personally always trusted Miroslav, but anyway. Uh, anybody else? Maybe one more question? No? Okay. Well, let's be very clear. Uh, the changes of border are <coughs> not on the agenda, will not be on the agenda. It's totally not acceptable. I mean, we, the, 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 the setup of the Western Balkans is final. European Union will never support any changes of borders, and we shall not uh, think in the direction that uh, changing borders might solve our problems. It would open Pandora's box in the, in the region with an unpredictable uh, uh, impact and it's better not to dwell on it. Our military presence uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, continues uh, in uh, line with the uh, decisions made by the ministers of foreign affairs in October. It's going to be, uh, well, partly downgraded, uh, refocused more on uh, training, education, and uh, the deterrence uh, effect will be now shifted more to the over-the-horizon forces. This is based on the conclusions made by the military people, and they are also responsible uh, for, the, the, for the way how the, the forces are geographically located. But you know how uh, high is the mobility of our forces. So I have not been present at any discussions of uh, stationing uh, EU forces in Birchko directly, but uh, the ma their mandate uh, covers the entire territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and whenever they feel or see uh, threats to the territorial integrity or the constitutional order of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, they are ready uh, to act uh, on the basis of their mandate here. So, uh, on uh, regarding the, I was specifically asked to speak about European Union's policy, in, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, I, I believe it's important to outline and refresh to the audience what are the the strategies, instruments, tools the European Union has and applies in the region of the Western Balkans. Uh, 
we know very well and we miss no opportunity to stress that if we want to be successful, we need a firm as possible alliance between the European Union and the United States in the, in the Balkans. And that's what we do. We are in a daily contact. I am personally in daily contact with people who are forming and shaping the Western Balkan policy here in the State Department, in the NSC, so are my colleagues. We, we uh, are informing each other about everything we do, and I've also used my visit uh, to Washington DC to, to continue doing so. So I absolute, absolutely disagree with the, with the statement that there is no trust between the European Union and the United States. The, there is a strong trust, uh, and uh, this trust is being reinforced through our actions on the ground, starting from uh, Secretary Clinton and Lady Ashton down to our um, ambassadors on the ground in Sarajevo or in any other country of the region. Uh, I don't want to uh, elaborate on Ashton's visit here because it, this is not what I was asked to do, so let me just say that this vis visit was highly appreciated in the European Union, in Brussels and by our member states, which is also the fact of life. So, but uh, as I said, the combination of the soft and hard power, the fact that there are countries in the region who turn to Washington before they turn to Brussels, is a fact that we appreciate and therefore it's really important not to send signals that we might not be united because I do believe that we share the same ultimate goal for the region. And, uh, and it's nothing works better in the region when the United States and the European Union speak with the same voice. And that's uh, what we mutually understand very well. Maybe one last question if it's a quick one. Please. Mr. Lajcik, um, you come from Slovakia. You were a diplomat in Slovakia. Your country does not recognize Kosovo. Four other countries don't recognize Kosovo. It's a reality, but what that says in terms of the European Union speaking with one voice, being capable of implementing the strategies that you're talking about, when there is no consensus of uh, <coughs> how to move forward and prolong the uh, issue of uh, full recognition of Kosovo, not only by European Union, but other countries, and allow, after 20 years, people to enjoy the same rights that the rest of Europe enjoy? As I said, it's a reality, uh, uh, and uh, therefore we have to, 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 to build our policies on, on, on this reality. It doesn't make life for the European Union easier, but uh, this, this is where we are. And uh, if you want to know my personal opinion, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why I believe in a dialogue and why I, I encourage the both parties to engage in dialogue. Because uh, if you want the non-recognizers to recon reconsider their, po their policy, there must be a reason for them to do so. That means they, they, it's, the, the national positions are based on, on, on the resolution of their parliaments. You don't <coughs> go to parliaments to say, I mean, I've, I've reconsidered. You have to come back to your parliament to say, there is a different reality on the ground. They are talking to each other, they are accepting the documents, they are traveling freely, they are uh, supporting each, uh, each other in regional forests. So th there is a new situation compared to the one when the decision was made. And therefore, it's time for, for us maybe to reconsider this our position. Uh, so this is uh, something that Pristina should bear in mind, know, knowing how important it is uh, to present itself as a credible international player, particularly through the dialogue. and. Uh, Believe me that this is a very powerful instrument with multi multiple impact, including on the issue you just raised. Okay, Europe has spoken. Thank you, Miroslav.